Today's guest is Sammy the Bull, Salvatore Gravano, one of the most famous, notorious mafia hitmen ever. He started off in the Colombo crime family, went off into the Gambino crime family, and was a notorious hitman behind 19 hits. Part of his famous story is that he worked with the FBI to put John Gotti behind bars, one of the first big RICO cases of taking down the crime families. We get to explore this guy's life. So it's a tremendous treat and honor to talk to Sammy the Bull. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor today to talk to Sammy the Bull. This is a guy I've been excited for weeks to speak to. Uh, He has an extensive, interesting history. He was in the mafia, um, and he's doing a lot of interesting things currently today. We could start anywhere in the world with a guy like you, Sammy. But first where I want to start is last night we were on the block, uh, I think 71st and somewhere in the hood of Phoenix. And gangsters are... They got the grills, they're pointing guns at the camera, they're kind of accidentally pointing the guns at you while you're talking to them, and I see you back here, some of your pictures where you're wearing a suit, it was a very classy uh, difference that I'm noticing. Can you walk me through your idea of what the current state of guys running things today is and how it compares to back when you were running things? Well, I don't know who you came across and what kind of, the gangs more than the mafia um, back in the day. The mafia was, uh, you know, sophisticated organization. We did crimes. We ran unions. We did different things to make money. We didn't go out bothering people. Um, I think we thought it was the worst thing you could do. You're going to have people hating you, against you. So we didn't do that. We kept our neighborhoods as clean as humanly possible. Respect for the people. Um, they respected us. They actually felt comfortable with us because we protected neighborhoods. We didn't let child molesters in. We didn't let rapists in. Uh, If you came into those neighborhoods and did things like that, you got killed. So the neighborhoods were safer. We did murders, but people came to the conclusion they killed themselves for breaking rules, but they don't bother innocent, legitimate people, especially women and children. So it's a whole different scenario than... These M13 gangs and gangs like that, they have no respect. They kill for a bicycle. They'll rob a store. The guy will give them the money from the cash register. I was just telling you a story. And then they'll shoot the guy. I was in prison with a guy. And I said, why the fuck did you shoot him? He gave you the money. He said, well, he could have been a witness. So I said, then why didn't the fuck you wear a mask? I mean, you just intentionally went in there to shoot him and get the money. So I, this, I don't even understand stuff like that. It does seem like there's a, just a big lack of respect, and that's a, a big difference from your era to now, is there's guys that, like the way they talk about women in their music, the way, I mean, there's no trust within the groups either. Like, uh, like one of the, their best friend today could be the guy that they shoot tomorrow. Um, the priorities are way off. It's not really a community-oriented thing. It's, it's actually something that kind of terrifies the community. Uh, tell me more about how the community felt about the presence of the mafia. They felt comfortable, like I said. I mean, we protected our neighborhoods. We protected the people. You see, you just hit the nail on the head. These people, these kids come up, and they think by terrifying the neighborhood, everybody's afraid of them, that gives them respect, and that gives them a right to do all kinds of things. But it's, it's, it's the reverse. It don't happen. The people will hate you. We didn't do things like that. So tell me more about the code, because I think that's what we're missing today, was the code. What was the code like in the mafia? What were the things you stuck to, and what were the things that just were you didn't do or you are going to be whacked? Well, there's a lot of things. The mafia has a whole set of rules, different things. We respect one another. Um, we act a certain way. Um, we talk a certain way. I mean, we curse a lot, but uh, other than curse words... You know, when I was younger, and even before I even got into the mafia, we would be out 1 o'clock in the morning, somebody in the apartment house, a woman would come out of the window, go home, it's late. Uh, We wouldn't go home, but we would leave and go into the schoolyard or go hang out. Today, if you do that, a guy takes out a gun and shoots at the woman or throws a shot just to scare her. It's, It's a total lack of respect. It's a Families deterioration, drugs is playing a tremendous part. We have drug problems in the country that are phenomenal. And I think it's partly the government. 
you know, right now everybody's lost respect for every in every way. Our institutions. Our institutions are lying to people. The newspapers are lying to people. So no, the the lack of respect that we don't have it anywhere. What they're teaching in school. I mean, you see some of the things they're teaching in school. You know, I'm not against gay people, but I mean, they're teaching a guy dresses up with a dress, and he calls himself a woman. We gotta accept that. And I don't care what he does, but we don't have to accept it. We don't have to accept it. They're gonna put they put urinals in out here in a school in a elementary school. So in the woman's bathroom, in a, in a girl's bathroom, yes, urinals. That seems a bit so absurd, woman, doesn't it? It is absurd, but I mean, and we're allowing it. There's no outcry, so a guy could come out and take his uh, dick out and uh, piss in a urinal, and there's little girls, six, seven, eight, nine years old, running around looking at that, seeing that, and we're supposed to accept that as a norm. So the whole system now is just falling apart in this country. We have other countries. I heard uh, Putin give a speech the other day. And they don't need bombs. They don't need anything. They, he turned around and said the United States is falling apart within. They're losing their morals, their scruples, their religious values. They're falling apart. So leave them alone. We don't have to go to war. We don't have to do anything. They're just killing themselves. They're falling apart. And uh, it actually sounded like he gave a, a good speech, something that meant something. It's something that's going on in this country. So it's going from the top government, high officials, politicians, and it's dribbling down all over the place. The legal system is a joke. What makes you say that? Well, they're getting arrested and they come out some bad crimes, some vicious crimes, and they just come right out. So how do you how do you control people if you're going to do that? Yeah, I know in Milwaukee that teenagers can steal your car, get caught for it, get let out before the paperwork's done, and go steal a car again. And really, right. until they're an adult, there are no real consequences. I know I talked to a homicide detective. That's one of my buddies from the jiu-jitsu gym. And... I said, you know, what, what is the solution or where, where are things going? And he said, it's almost like you have to just rebuild from scratch. Like there's just uh, a solid amount of people that are getting away with so many crazy things that it's hard to salvage at this point. It is. It is. Now they want to take away police, police force. And, I, and that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And I'm a criminal talking like that. I'm it not, is a bit ironic to hear you talking about that. But it's crazy. In other words, uh, you, you right now fall on the floor and have a heart attack. What do you want me to do? Call a psychologist? Or you call the police to get an ambulance? Mm. I mean, it's just, the whole thing is ridiculous. And, uh, and it's making the country fall apart. Mm. So... There's so many different areas you can go into and uh, about rules and regulations. There's uh, Families are falling apart. I blame colleges and universities. Everybody goes to college nowadays, so they leave their family. And then they get a job in another state. So families are broken up. They don't live together. When I was a kid, you lived in a neighborhood. You, your family lived in them neighborhoods. They were always there. They died, they left the house to their son. So that family was always there. So you knew your neighbors, you knew the families, and it was a different feeling. Today, it's the, the families are broken up. When you lose families, when you lose religion, when you lose your values in so many different ways, you're going to lose the country. And that's exactly what's going on today. Tell me more about the Italian family structure back in the day, because from what I understand... As a kid, you live there until you get married, and it's a lot more, it's normal to have in-laws or your uncle stay over. Like, it's just a lot more of a cohesive family unit and something that we're really missing in today. Tell me more about what that looked like. Well, my mother and father owned a small little dress factory, and they're fortunate enough. They bought a country home in Long Island. And uh, when we used to go away for the summers, and, and uh, there was always cousins, uncles, aunts, everybody there. So... I used to ask my mother and father, how come everybody comes to our house? So they said, we are making a few dollars. We're a little fortunate. And we invite them up. So they're all family. We eat together. We stay together. 
So they had that mentality. They don't have that anymore. You're lucky you get them to come to a birthday party or something. Um, but then we were always together, and we grew up. Cousins, we came like brothers and sisters, you know, different cousins, and because we were always around each other, whether it was a summer, a wedding, a holiday, no matter what it was, we were always together. Mm. So, And they don't have that. So one thing that sparked my fascination with uh, mafia culture and then finding you as a book you have on your shelf back there, The Five Families. And so uh, something that occurred to me was the concept of being a made man. And this could be something that took years and years to be. And, this, and a made man in the mafia is an officially sworn in, protected, known man. I guess walk me through what it took to become a made man and what made you even think this is a route I want to go down in the first place. Well, it's not a job, so you don't go and sign up to be going to the mafia. It's usually the old timers would sit around. They see, they know the neighborhood, they know the kids, they know their families. The kid would get in trouble in school, maybe they would see what happened. The kid would get in trouble with the cops. He wouldn't talk. He got a beaten. They knew what the kid was. When you grew up and you got older, you were in a little bit of a gang. They knew who you. They knew how you conducted yourself. Eventually, a made guy would bring you in to belong, and if you agreed to it, you were an associate. To become a made member, a captain or a made member would have to propose you to be one of them. It's a secret society and a brotherhood. So they thought enough about you to propose you to come in. When you go into a ceremony, they ask you questions. This is a secret society and a brotherhood. Would you want to belong with us? And you could say yes or no. Uh, but people knew in advance when you were called to that meeting, I knew already what, you know, a little bit about what it was about. And, of course, I wanted to uh, belong. What kind of track record did you put together for these guys to say, he's someone that we believe in and, and want on our side? I really didn't put together any track record. It's just your performances in life, what you do, how you act. Um, I'll give you one example. When I was young, my father bought me a beautiful bike. It was expensive, a Schwinn. Um, we, have, we don't have a lot of money. That's all you're going to get. Somebody stole it. So one day my friends came. I was in a store, and they said, your bike is down the block near the fruit and vegetable store, and two kids got it. I went down there. They were older than me, bigger than me. Uh, but I was, I, once I got it, I wasn't giving that bike up. So I fought like a bastard for, with these kids, getting beat up a little bit, but I wouldn't let go of the bike. And one of the guys in the bar across the street, like good fellas, they would hang out all dressed up. And uh, one of them came over, and he knew my father, my mother, and he says, you're, you're Jerry's son. What's your name? Sammy. Another guy asked him, what's going on? He says, no, it's Jerry's son, Sammy. Look at the way he's fighting. He's like a little bull. And that stuck. And they saw, you know, they're, they're watching you as a person. It sounds you know, like they observed your tenacity. Yes. They, and, and if you didn't belong in their life, you never got in. Then nobody would propose you to become a made member. You were going to college. You, you were gone. But if you were a street kid and they looked at your tenacity and your respect towards people and stuff like that, they like that. Somebody's got balls in it, but he's got respect and manners, and, you know, he knows how to control himself. Uh, you know, we don't want to just complete lunatics in the life. So you were, you were proposed and brought into the life. So it's not something that you asked to be come in, they wouldn't allow you in. They wanted you in. They accepted you. They proposed you. And then they asked you. So when you went through the ritual, took the oath, and you became a made man, what was going through your head during that ceremony? Was it triumph? Was it excitement? Were you a little bit nervous? Walk me through, because this sounds like a, a moment in life that starts the next chapter and continues the journey. What was that like? Well, as growing up, my neighborhood, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, was saturated with gangsters. There were legends, a lot of them. Their names, Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, you name it, uh, they, they came from New York and Brooklyn and places like that, the Bronx and everywhere else. So they were legends to me. We had respect for them. We knew what they did. We knew there was murders and stuff involved. We, we 
respected them. We feared them a little bit, but they were idols to us. So when I was brought into the life, I never imagined becoming a made member and becoming one of them with these legends. So it was a lot of excitement for me. It was a new thing for me. Family meant something to me. So when they said, this is our family, you're going to belong to our family. Those words were important. Uh, the guy who was my boss, this guy Shorty Spiro, said, I'll never lie to you. I'll never betray you. I'll never stab you in the back. Um, we'll ask you to do things. And I know what that meant, Murders. He said, I have done that. I will go with you or maybe just send you. Are you willing? And I agreed. And I did my first murder when I was 24 years old. I got in. I was in the military when I was 19. I was drafted during the Vietnam War. Mm. I was in there for two years. I came out at 21, 23. I became an associate with the Colombo family. A while later, I was transferred over to the Gambino family. And I got made when I was uh, in 1976. How did you get transferred? What, what, what was that like? I had an argument within the family. Shorty's brother, this guy, Ralph Spiro, and uh, I went to his house with a gun to kill him. And uh, they found out, and uh, they called me, and there was meetings and about it. The Gambino family spoke for me. They felt I was right. The only thing they felt is that I went to his house, and I was going to kill him in front of his wife and kids. That was wrong. But they felt he was wrong, and I did the right thing by wanting to kill him. I should have killed him somewhere else. So just because the way you went about it was what caused the issue, but not that you wanted to take him out in the first place. Right. Um, it was where I was going to do it. And then he was Shorty's brother. Shorty was a made guy. So they weren't going to kill Ralph. They weren't going to kill me because they felt I was right. So the Gambino family spoke for me, and they made a decision that I wouldn't hurt Ralph and I would be transferred over to the Gambino family. Um, that happened in uh, 1971 or two. And uh, in 1976, I became made. So we were talking about code and respect a little bit earlier. I think one of the things that I gathered was that none of these hits would take place in the presence of women. That was a really big, or in the presence of family members, right? It was supposed to be, you get the guy somewhere or secluded, but never take them out in front of their family. Is that kind of a big deal in that code? Well, there's no actual line of what you could do. I mean, you don't want to go to a guy's house and shoot him right in front of his wife and kids. Mm -hmm. There's always a place and a time. So, you know, I became a professional hit guy. So that, uh, you just don't do that. And you, do, you don't want to do it where you're going to wind up hurting innocent people, stuff like that. Now, it may sound hypocritical. I had plotted and planned the Castellano hit, and we did that in front of tens of thousands of people, cops on every corner. And and the reason we did it that way is that we were planning and plotting to kill him for months and months and months, and we couldn't get a spot. If I remember the story correctly, this was at a a big-time speech, and he was on stage, right? And there, was this the, was that no, this? No, yeah, that's Joe Colombo you're talking about. Okay, so can you walk us through that story of a hit that took place in, tens of, in front of tens of thousands of people? The Castellano hit? Yes. Well, we were going to hit him, and uh, we were going to take him out. It was, it's a whole lengthy story. Um, I won't get into the whole thing, but it took months and months and months we were working on it. And one day, we got a tip that he was going to be in Spark Steakhouse, with a meeting, and uh, me, John Gotti, and Frankie DeChico were the main players. And uh, I had said, that's perfect. We know where he's going, we know what time he's going to meet, and we know where he has to park the car. They'd park right in the front. Guy would take the car and go park it, so he would be, we knew exactly everything. John Gotti had told me, that's crazy. There's tens of thousands of people and cops on every corner. Frankie DeChico barked right back at him and said, listen, Sammy's been involved in two mafia wars already. He's a great planner. This is the plan, John. That's what we're going to do. If you're against it, then you do it. Me and Frankie, we're out. Me and Sammy, he said, because Frankie was talking. 
And John agreed. Okay. And we planned the entire thing. We used the crowds to our favor. I knew once bullets started flying, there would be such a confusion, people screaming, yelling, running in every which direction. It would work in our favor. And uh, it did. Even the, the, the agents and the cops after said this was so professional, so well planned and plotted and carried out. Matter of fact, after I cooperated, I sat with agents and they told me there was a cop who saw it as it came down. He was off duty. And they questioned him. Why didn't he take his revolver that they carry when they're off duty and make a move? So the guy told them it was so well done. I knew there had to be backup shooters and everything else. And I wasn't going to do it. So I said, where was he standing? I was, I had the walkie-talkie and was controlling the entire hit, the hit team, everybody. I was also a backup shooter. So when they said, he's standing over here at this point, they showed me on the map. I said he was 100% right. I'm 75 feet behind him. If I would have saw him pull out a gun, I would have jumped out of the car, and I would have killed him. So he was right. And they looked at it stunned, and they said, uh, oh, wow. Then he was right. Yeah. How did you become so good at this? Was there an extensive amount of experience you got in Vietnam that really played a part in you being good at this role? No. I didn't go to Vietnam. I was in during the Vietnam War. I trained in the infantry, and I trained to kill. But I never went to Vietnam, uh, luckily. And uh, I don't know. My first hit was a guy named Joe Colucci in the Colombo family under Shorty before I was transferred. And what did he do to get earn the hit? His wife was banging... Shorty's nephew, Tommy Spiro's, his nephew. He found out about the affair. And he plotted a plan to kill Tommy, but he was afraid Shorty would put it together. And uh, so he got another guy in the crew, a guy named Frankie, and he asked him to help him. And uh, Frankie said, help you do what? I'm going to kill Shorty, and I'm going to kill Sammy. So Frankie said, Sammy's not banging your wife, bro. We all knew about what was going on. Why do you want to bang out Sammy? Why do you want to take him out? He said, Shorty will put two and two together. And who's he going to send? He's going to send Sammy to kill me. So if I kill the two of them now, there'll be so much confusion. After they're dead for six months, then I'll kill this fucking kid for banging my wife. But the only thing he didn't plan on is that Frankie went to his boss, Shorty, who was the boss of our crew, and told him about the plan. Shorty went to Carmine Persico, who was his captain. It went to Joe Colombo, who was the boss of the family. Joe Colombo gave the order to, to Carmine Persico, to Shorty, give Sammy the hit. And that was my first hit. Now... I had seen in movies that when people do something like this, they're sweating, they're nervous, they're scared. They're, you know, all these things, I see these things in movies, and I thought that's what happens to you. But the night I did the hit, um, I came back, it was over. I killed him, I shot him twice in the head and three times in the body. And uh, when I got back, I went to an apartment where a bunch of us were living. And uh, I went under a shower, a nice, warm, hot shower. And I was letting the water just roll off of me. And uh, I was waiting for what I saw in the movies, hmm. to start sweating, to be nervous, to be scared. I didn't feel anything. I got dried up and I went to bed. I slept like a baby. I got up the next morning, and uh, 
so many young girls were running around. Oh my God, they killed Joe Colucci. It's in the newspapers, and this, and they dumped his body. Up. And I had asked the girl. I said, "Do they know who did it?" She said, "No, it doesn't say anything like that in the paper." And then we all went to the corner where we hung out. I had like an out of body experience. I oh, I felt like I was way above everybody and everything looking down at them, scrambling and talking and stuff. I remember I didn't feel nothing. That little trance, I was brought out of that. Tommy Spiro says, my Uncle Shorty Spiro wants to see you. He's going to pick you up in a few minutes. I went down to Carroll Street, where Carmine Persico was. He was a captain. He was a boss. He was very dangerous. Came out. He knew the whole story. He grabbed me, hugged me, kissed me. He did a great job. And uh, I went back. And I thought about it a little bit. I thought about that I didn't feel remorse. I didn't feel nothing. So I thought to myself, you must be a fucking just a natural born killer. Uh, I'm a perfectionist with things construction, all things. In the mafia, I have learned how to become a professional hit guy, and I became a perfectionist with it. And uh, I obviously must have been good at it because uh, Paul Castellano used me to go commit murders after the Colombo family. Um, John Gotti, when he took over, he asked me to do murders. When I got a hit, I'm going to use you as an example, of course. It's not you. But if I know I'm going to kill you, mm -hmm. I don't think of anything anymore. Women, money, nothing. The only thing I could think about is you. I follow you. I watch you. I do research on you. I find out where I'm going to kill you and when I'm going to kill you and how I'm going to kill you. you I don't stop thinking about that until you're dead. So I became very good at it. And I was, became, got a reputation about it. I was in three mafia wars. I was involved in 19 murders. I didn't commit 19 murders, but I was involved in 19 murders. I did 22 years of my life in prisons. And I became, a, I went from a made guy to an acting captain a year after I was made. And then I became a captain. Then I became the Gunzier of the family. And then under John Gotti, I became the underboss of the family. And all through that period of time, I've done work. Work meaning hits. Did you ever feel like a sense of paranoia that your card might be called because you've either been involved in too much or you knew too much or you may have wronged the wrong person? Did you ever think, wonder if your card was going to be pulled? No. I'll give you the reasons why. I never fucked anybody. I never backstabbed. I never lied. I never cheated. I never did anything. When you have things like that in your mind, you know you cheated. You know you're a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. So you're always wondering, what if they find out? I didn't have that fear because I never did those things. I was honorable with people within the life and out of the life as well. So I didn't have that paranoia. I didn't, I wasn't afraid because when I came into the life at 23 years old, I knew one day I would need to go to prison for the rest of my life or I would be killed. I knew it. So that I lost fear of it. As I started to age, as I started to become heavier in my positions and, and I had a very strong crew around me, I had no fear of it. The fear I was gone because it was something that I knew was going to happen. I could ask you right now, are you afraid because you're going to die? Everybody dies. Sure. So you're going to die. You know that. Not now. You're a young man. But someday you're going to die. Mm. And maybe before. I know people OD and on, you know, all kinds of stuff. So are you afraid of it every minute of your life? No. No, because you know it's going to happen eventually. And you do things, you live your life. So I lived my life in the mafia without fear of dying. 
It was just a matter of when. Either prison, dying, whether it's cancer, whether it's a bullet in the head. What the fuck is the difference? What made that lifestyle so attractive that you were willing to accept those two outcomes, death or prison? First of all, the mafia was uh, created in Sicily. Sicily only eight or 900 years ago. It's part of my heritage. I'm Sicilian. My mother and father are Sicilians. They're legitimate people, but it's part of my heritage. It started in Italy, Sicily. <clears throat> um, it came to the United States and went to other parts of the world. It was a family. <clears throat> like I said, it was family to me. And it was part of my heritage. I followed in footsteps of giants. Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, Vito Genovese, Carlo Gambino, and on and on and on. So a lot of those people I looked up to. And I was becoming them. I was going to be a part of history of my, my race. And I was going to do the best job humanly possible. And I'm not going to be afraid of the life. I understood the life. I understood. You know, it's like when I was 19, I got drafted into the military during the Vietnam War. Mm. You could ask me that same question. Were you scared? No. No. I was drafted into the United States. I was going to fight for my country, fight against communists, all that bullshit, which wound up being bullshit. Yeah. Now, if I would have went to Vietnam, I never went, I would have killed people because I'm. it's part of my culture, it's part of my country, it's part of what's going on. So I'm not going to fear them. I don't fear them. I'm going to kill them. I'm not thinking I'm going to die there. I might but I'm going there to fight in a war. So I had no fear of going there. I'm going to give you another example. When we had, I had, we got our company, 2nd Brigade, 5th Infantry Division, we had orders to go to Vietnam. And we all run around, we all know each other, we're young guys like you guys, and getting our stuff together, and there was lists on where you're going to go, and where you're going to, and my name wasn't on the list. Mm. Me and a whole bunch of other guys. So I said, how come our names ain't on the list? We're going with our friends and, and soldiers. So we went to the office and we, I asked, why isn't my name on the list? And they said, because you have to have a one year left. They're not going to ship you all the way there. You'll stay there a little while. They're going to ship you all the way. They want you to have at least one year. I only had eight months left on my duty. So anybody with under a year, they took them off. So that's why all these other guys, me and all these other guys, were not on the list. So I didn't go. I stayed in the United States. But did I fear it? No. I was actually disappointed. Why am I not going? Why am I not going with Tom? Tommy's going, and me and him hang out every day, and we do the same shit. He's going. Why ain't I going? Is my attitude. So I had the same attitude in the military for the country as I had towards Cosa Nostra, which is the mafia. So you definitely seem like a man of action. And uh, one thing I'm curious about is I think if people are picturing mafia lifestyle in their head, it's a lot of action, it's a lot of hits, it's a lot of rackets. But my impression was that a good part of the day is drinking espresso, playing cards, fine dining. And when it was time to take care of business, you guys went after it 100%. But what was the actual day-to-day -day and flow of a made man. Exactly what you said. We went to a club, a social club. We'd play a little cards. We'd drink. We'd have coffee. We'd bullshit. Just like we're doing right this minute. Not with microphones, of course. Go out on dates, women, driving fancy cars, dressing a little fancy every now and then. Um, and we hung out. It was a, just a way of life. It was like being with a family. When you got up in the morning... You know, you're in your house, you're with your brothers, and you, you know, you relate with one another, and then you go out. Us, we that this was our family. When we went out, we were together. We were relating. We were dating and going with girls or going to a club at night 
or serious things we had to do or whatever. But that wasn't an everyday thing. Everyday thing was just like any normal human being, you know. Uh, so it was just part of my life. It was part of my job. It was part of, I didn't have a nine to five job. I wasn't, you know, my job was, uh, and I was in businesses. I ran businesses and unions as I got more mature and more into the life. So I did do other things as far as business and stuff like that, and making money, that became a priority. And, um, you know, and the, the life has a, it's a different effect. I mean, I used to sit down with my captain, Tato, Tato Arello, in his backyard. It was almost like watching the movie The Godfather. He sat in the back, rolled up his cuffs, put on galoshes, and he would sit there with a cigar hanging out of his mouth, spraying the tomato plants and the, the, the fig tree and, and, and everything else. It was gorgeous, and I would sit there and talk with him and listen to the old days about Lucky Luciano, and he grew up with them. I didn't. I was too young. And uh, so I would listen to all those stories. Then a lot of times people came from the neighborhood, legitimate people, with their problems. And occasionally he would let me sit next to him and I could hear their problems being told to him. He would solve their problems like a godfather would. That was tremendously interesting to me. And I learned so much from him. So, you know, it was a, just a way of life that was very, very interesting to me. So another thing that was hard to wrap my head around was the reach of the mafia and how many businesses and rackets and areas they had their tentacles in. For example, it was said that I think during the 1980s that nearly every skyscraper that went up in New York, they added on an extra million of extra cost, whether it's the union guys to, to prevent walking off the job or labor disruptions or at each window that's getting put in, they got a 2 or $4 markup on, uh, the garment factories, the gas tax. Walk people through some of the different revenue streams. And I know it was different by family, but what was the stuff you were familiar with and what, what was particularly interesting to you? We were into everything, the garment industry, the garbage industry, um, construction, you name it, we were in it. And we elevated the price a little bit and we took a bite. So you're basically the subcontractor. You'd get the job and you'd cut your, your, your bid off the top and then you'd pass it to the person that actually does it. Is that the right understanding? In some cases. In my case, I owned companies as well. So I created a company. I had a drywall company. I had 200 carpenters working for me. So uh, when I bid drywall jobs, I went for the job myself. Now, I'll give you examples. I, there was a guy I knew, a pretty good guy. He owned a container company to pick up the garbage and construction debris and stuff. He had a small little business, made about 100000 a year. Um, and I went to him and I said, bro, you're running a good company. You do great work. I'd like to go partners with you. I could get you containers you're buying a shit. I can get containers from Jersey that are twice as good. They're much better. Containers for cheaper than you're paying, number one. And I can get you a lot of work. And here's what I'll do with you. He told me he's making 100000 a year. So I said, if we go partners, the first 100000 is yours. Anything above that, we're partners 50-50. And he said, Sammy, that's fair. No contracts, no nothing. We shook hands. A year or so after, we got him work and we did all kinds of things. I was able to get him contracts in the city with these high rises where he could put containers. He was picking up garbage in front of people's houses when they cleaned the house. Now he's picking up construction debris and all kinds of stuff. So I had told him, "How did you? How did we do?" He said, "I put the, I made three hundred thousand. I put a hundred thousand on the side." My first hundred, like you told me, the other two hundred thousand. We're partners. I'll take a hundred and I'll give you a hundred. That's good. 
as I progressed in life, I was beyond that. I told him, uh, every now and then, throw me an envelope. It's your business. I'm out. I'm busy doing a bunch of other things. I can't help you as much as I did. I will help you. And if somebody bothers you, let me know, and I'll take care of your problem. How much do you want to be bought out? I want your friendship. I want an envelope every year. Whether it's my birthday or it's Christmas. If you're doing great, give me an envelope. I'll leave it up to you. I don't want nothing. It's your business. The container is everything I started with you. We'll stay friends. That's important to me. And that's the way I did business. So when you asked originally, are you worried about... I wasn't worried about shit. That's the way I treated people. At one point after I cooperated, the government said, how come none of these contractors or anybody ratted on you? And I had said, why? Why would they? They all made money with me. I didn't bully them. I didn't abuse them. I was good towards their families. I bought their families presents. When they were sick, I was there for them to help them a little bit. Why would they rat on me? For what? That they made money with me? So I didn't have those fears, and I didn't have that. Now, my team could tell you better than me. I'm talking about things that happened 40, maybe even 50 years ago. The guy that I owned that company with, a guy named Joe Madonia, 40-something years ago, sends me letters now that I'm doing this. Haven't seen him in years. He sends me a letter. Sammy, I love you. I hope you're doing great. If you ever need me, give me a holler. <coughs> and I get letters like this on and off constantly from people 20, 30, and 40, and even 50 years ago. So how bad of a dude could I have been mm. When people are now, they don't have to, they can give a fuck less about me. But they're still sending letters, girlfriend, ex-girlfriends are talking to me, and uh, I never had bad, bad relationships with people. Mm. So what were the tactics the mafia used to get the bid? How did you guys strong arm your way into getting all of that business? Unions and things we could do for them. These, bi these business guys are not stupid. I'll give you an example back with my drywall company. Well, if Sammy gets the job, first of all, he's got 200 carpenters. He does the job. He's, that's not a, just a shakedown. I bid the job. I'm going to be able to do the job. I don't push him for money. Here's how I make my money. It's supposed to be a union job. A union guy back then was getting 30 bucks an hour plus union benefits and all kinds of shit. So I charge him $25 an hour. No union benefits, no nothing, because my guys are coming in non-union. He's saving a bunch of money. One. Two, he knows I'm capable of doing the work. Three, he has a problem with the plumbers union. He's not a stupid guy. They're not stupid, these contractors. Hey, Sammy, what? I got uh, these plumbers, that they're, 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 they're going to strike, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Well, what happened? They tell me what happened. 20 minutes later, I'm reaching Joe Blow, who was connected with the plumbers. Bro, I got a job over here, and the plumbers are breaking their balls. What do they want? They want to eat something? I could get them a little money. Back off. Yeah, Sammy, yeah, I, I, that'll be good. So I go to the contract, and I say, put five, ten thousand. Uh, in an envelope for me. And I take care of it. Boom. I get the money, I give it to him to give to them. He makes a little piece. The union guy makes a little piece. The union backs off. Everybody's fucking happy. That's why they don't rat on me. Speaking of the money in envelopes, that seems like a key mafia tradition, whether it's usually around Christmas time, but the different bosses, their associates, which come up with different uh, chunks of money in an envelope as a way to say, Thank you, and as a way to have kind of honor and respect. Is that? Yes. Can you walk me through that? Well, Christmas time, you want to give your boss, like the father of your family, you give him an envelope. If it's your captain, or whether it's the boss himself, or whoever, you're under. It's the envelopes go up. They don't come back down. They go up. <coughs> so, it's about respect, and it's about 
you did well. And you got to remember, when you're in the mafia, the, the mafia itself gives you a lot of help, tremendous amount of help. I'm going to give you another example. You're a good cook, and you're going to open up a little restaurant right here in my neighborhood. So uh, you tell me about it. I said, that's good. Make sure the food is good and the service is good because there's a lot of competition, especially in New York. Yeah. So now you have to go out and, and make good food, good service, and build people a reputation for yourself, right? But he don't because he's with me in the mafia. So I tell all kinds of my people, he's opening up uh, his own little restaurant. <clears throat> he's a friend with us. And uh, tell your family to go there. So all of a sudden, he opens his doors. Mm. You're struggling to build a, 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 a membership. Yeah. He gets 100 people going there like this. So there's so much power in the network and the momentum. Right. And the mafia. Right. So it could be a simple thing like that. So now, what does he do? I come in, he don't want to charge me. And he turns around, whether it's my birthday or Christmas or maybe sometime every once in a while... He's a good guy. He realizes what happened. He puts a little envelope. See, I'm doing great here. Put this here. Take your wife and kids on vacation or do whatever. It could be voluntary that way. In the, in the movies, everybody's going to be bullying, bullying him or threatening him. We don't have to do that. We just have to do the right thing. When my daughter was 18 years old on her birthday, I got a guy who was a florist, a good florist. And I told the guy, I want to go partners with you. And he said, yeah, yeah, Sammy, it would, yeah, I would love it. So I said, well, it's not me, my daughter. I want you to go partners with my daughter. She went partners 50-50. He was the florist. I put the thing together, and I gave my daughter the keys. I said, here, it's yours. Happy birthday. But those keys, you got to go in the morning, open the fucking store, and work. If you don't, he goes back to what he was doing. I get rid of the store. And you go do whatever you want to do. So I told her, you got to work. Even though I'm going to help you, you got to work. The flowers took off like this. Every holiday, Sammy's daughter's place. So she's automatically got 100 people coming. Now they're doing good work, and the guy was a great florist, and they were doing even better. But without my help, it would have took forever to get to that point. So he knew that. That's why he left his job and came right over. He knew that would happen. So that's the mafia. So that's the good side of the mafia. It's not really the bad side of the mafia. There's a bad side. And there's people who are thuggerish, don't have this common sense, and they're just bullies. So there's people in the life like that. Just like every life, we have fucking psychopaths in the life. Now, people might be calling me that because I'm involved in 19 murders, but I'm not. So it's just part of the life. Was there any aspect of the, the mafia that you found regrettable or, I mean, the bad side? I mean, were those guys uh, pruned out of the organization? Were they allowed to flourish? Walk me through no, that Roy side. Roy became a serial killer. It was killing now innocent people who had nothing to do with the mafia, had nothing to do with nothing. Now, here's how we prune them out. We killed them. We don't want a serial killer in the mafia. We don't want those kind of people. So he got killed. He was found in the trunk, and that was his crimes. He became a serial killer. Once we recognized that, he got killed. So that's how we pruned them out, in your words. Um, we got rid of them. For so much of the mafia's history, I think it would be fair to say they were regarded as nearly untouchable. And then there was an invention uh, called the RICO, the RICO cases, that seemed to really change that. Um, Tell people, because I don't think, when we look at criminals today, I don't think we have a concept or even a close comparison to how untouchable the mafia was at that time, right? Well, we were in everybody's pocket. Hoover, the director of the FBI, was close with the mafia. Now, he was gay. People said, well, you, you were holding that over his head. No, we weren't. We didn't give a fuck whether he was gay or straight. He was the famous cross-dresser, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
And we knew that, but we never bothered them about that. So we, we don't care about that. Uh, what we cared about is that he had, he loved going with his friends to the track and betting on horses and stuff. We would fix races and tell him what race. The third race, the, 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 the four horse. And he would go with his friends and bet. And the four horse would win and he would be psyched. It wasn't even the money. He just loved the excitement. He didn't look at the mafia as street gangs or something that was horrible like he the, he he, he fa- focused in on Bonnie and Clyde uh baby Felix Nelson all them you know crooks and people from there that were killing people robbing things and he went after them more he thought the mafia was more civilized he dealt with them he liked them and he backed them. As a matter of fact I remember he went to some sort of committee and he said there's no such thing as the mafia the whole country knew there was a mafia Here's the director of the FBI saying there's no such thing. Then he made a statement. They take numbers and they take sports. I, mean, I, don't, I don't care about them. And that's how he felt towards us. What murders we did with, was within us. You broke rules, you got killed. But I didn't go out killing Joe Blow. That wasn't things we did. Um... We, we had rules about we, we're not supposed to use bombs. Now, Capone Which used was bombs. famous in the 1920s with the black hand, right? There, there was a lot of bombings back in yeah, the day. Yeah. Well, they did that in Italy. You know, in Italy, they, it wasn't against their rules. They used bombs. So a lot of the people who came here from them, some of those guys used bombs. But it was against our rules to use bombs. It was used in occasion, uh, mostly Capone and... Uh, uh, Chicago, but the rest of the country, we very rarely used bombs because innocent people could be hurt. So you spoke about um, the power the mafia had, even having the, the director of the FBI claim that you don't exist. Another common theory that I think has emerged is that the mob was behind the assassination of JFK. Do you have any sort of take on that? Well, JFK was a good guy. He was a good president. We backed him. Those those elections were half rigged. We used everything we had, at unions, everything, to back him. Um, he was backed in Hollywood by the Rat Pack, Sinatra, and all of them. Um, Marilyn Monroe, the, the, the whole Rat Pack was close with him. It was his brother Bobby resented the fact that the father, Joe Kennedy, was a bootlegger. He was close with the mafia. Um, during prohibition and, and the whole time. And he came to the mafia for help to get his son elected. He was a good president. Um, he, he loved to fuck. He was banging Marilyn Monroe. He was banging all kinds. They were hooking, hooking him up with beautiful broads. That's all he really cared about. Matter of fact, Bobby Kennedy, he had a bad back uh, and his, he had a doctor giving him injections. Bobby Kennedy went after the doctor. What was he injecting? Cocaine and, and uh, some pain stuff. And he says, I'm going to indict him because he's giving you cocaine. He said, mind your fucking business. I don't get high. Whatever he's giving me helps my back. I, I don't feel no pain. Mm. Mind your fucking business. But Bobby Kennedy destroyed him because he went against the mafia in a vicious way. That created a lot of venom. But Bobby Kennedy not only fucked with the mafia which the deal was that that wouldn't happen, just like Hoover. He fucked with Hoover. He fucked with the vice president. He fucked with everybody, the CIA, everybody. So there was such a joint effort, everybody hated him, Bobby Kennedy. There's an old Sicilian thing. You cut off the head of the fish, the body dies. So that may have been... um, what they did with Kennedy. They killed John Kennedy because he was the president. Now, I'm not saying the mafia did it. I don't think they did. Hmm. After I cooperated, I was in a meeting with the feds, and they came down some heavyweights from Washington to talk to me. And they asked me about this Kennedy assassination and the mafia. And I said, you must be joking. You're going to ask me those questions? 
I could tell you one thing. Whoever was sitting on that fucking grassy knoll was probably a CIA guy, not a fucking mafia guy. Mm. We don't kill like that. Mm. So now they had a heart attack. Let me finish that. Yeah. They said, oh, this meeting never happened. Scrub all the notes. We're out of here. Sounds suspicious, doesn't it? Yeah, because I think my opinion is the government was on that fucking thing, CIA, not the mafia. Now, did they all participate in this murder? They all agreed. It's not just the mafia. It's a good part of the government. So when you get to that, I'm not positive who did what, but I will tell you one thing as a hit guy. If you look at the film, there's films, when he gets hit, he goes forward. Now, the guy is in a tower with a high-powered rifle, got hit in the neck. Now, when you get hit with a high-powered rifle, you're going to go flying forward. All of a sudden, he stops, and you see something come out of the front of his head, and he goes flying backwards. So the guy in the tower, I think, hit him in the neck. He went flying forward. The guy on the knoll hit him with a fucking rifle in the fucking forehead, and he went backwards. You don't go backwards when you get hit with a high-powered rifle in the back. Any hunter, anybody will tell you that. Any hit guy, anybody will tell you that. So I don't think the guy in the tower was the actual. He hit him, but he wasn't the guy who killed him. The guy who killed him was on the grassy knoll. Look at the, look at the video of him driving in the car. He goes forward. And then goes flying backwards right into his wife's hands. So, and they're saying that guy killed him. Now, common sense will tell you that he's hit in the front. That guy didn't kill him. The guy who shot him from the grassy knoll um, killed him. So there's a lot of lot of questions and a lot of things happened in that murder. People disappeared. Uh, medical records disappeared. How does all this th sh shit happen? How did they slow down? You think the mafia slowed down that thing to its crawl? Instead of going uh, 30 miles an hour, they were doing 12. You think the mafia could slow that, that caravan of cars? Or could somebody in government slow it down? So you could look at it a whole bunch of different ways. There's a lot of people asking me those questions, and I think there's stories about it, and it's all kinds of things. They'll say some of these are conspiracy theories. They're not. Just look at it. Mm -hmm. Look at it closely. Now, we're doing this interview. Get that video and look at it yourself. And see if something don't go fucking hit him right in the forehead. Now, the guy was behind him. He hit him in the back. How the fuck did he hit him in the front? He can't hit him in the front. Mm -hmm. So somebody else hit him. So... It makes sense. So you mentioned a couple of times now um, speaking with the feds. And that, so you go through decades of living this life, and then all of a sudden that makes a, a screeching halt, and the new chapter is written. So walk me through the, fighting the RICO charge with John Gotti and the other top bosses and what inspired you to say, you know what? Because you were the last guy that they ever expected to talk. Um, and I think... When people hear your story on why you did, I think they'll understand why. Well, the FBI, when I cooperated, they were terrified of me. They said, this, he ain't going to cooperate. It's too, they, they, you know, I, I would busted all my life, murder cases, everything. I never cooperated. And they were offered it to me a thousand times. Um, they said, it's too strong. It's a trap. He's going to do something crazy. This is, this is not real. That's what they believed in the beginning. But what happened is I got pinched with John Gotti in December of 90, 1990. We were in prison 11 months. John betrayed me. Um, he was setting me up to take the weight. Now, I'm not going to, it's a lengthy story. I'm not going to tell you, say the whole thing, but he was setting me up. And at the end, he told me after 11 months in prison with him, and the worst 11 months I did out of 22 years. He didn't want to go to prison. And uh, he told me, he said, Sammy, I'm going to control all the lawyers. The lawyers, I'm complaining about you on tapes, which is all bullshit. He said, but uh, 
We're going to use that. The lawyers are going to tell the jury. You could hear John complaining about Sam. He lost control of him. It wasn't John. It was him. And uh, I said, John, I mean, don't call John Gotti a rat. It's not, but it's a rat move. We're close. The government's the enemy. I'm not your enemy. You're not my enemy. Not supposed to be. But when you're now setting me up for the kill, you are my enemy. You're the same as them mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you're going to do that to me. And I asked him, John, are you sure that's what you want to do? He said, yes, yeah, Sammy, I have to. You got to take the weight. I'm the boss. I got to go free. And you got to take the weight. And I said, fuck him to myself. And fuck the mafia. I got in touch with the government. And I left. I switched sides. John was playing checkers while I was playing chess. And he lost. Now, when you were speaking with the government, uh, were you impressed by their capacity? Did you think they were incompetent? Like, What was your first impression when you started talking to them and hearing what they knew? No, no. They knew a lot, and they had a lot of confidential informants said that verified, you know, they're, they're, they're slick. They're, they're, they're pretty smart. You're talking about a big, very powerful, very smart organization. I mean, you know, when I told my stories or things, they already had information and confidential informants, bugs. So they knew that I was never lying with them. I told them the truth. I told them what went on. They were pretty good with me. Um, I'm still friends with some of them. The surprising thing to me is that in the mafia, I was double-crossed. John was the worst, but it's not uncommon in the mob. There was two agents who followed me all the time, Frank and Matty. I'm still friends with them. One guy's 82, one guy's 79, a little older than me. And uh, we're still friends. And they never betrayed me, lied to me, or did anything, which amazes me because she would think it would be the other way around. But it wasn't. So there's a lot of cops that I know now. Um, I mean, I didn't do business with them when I was in the mafia, but I knew them. They were around all the time. But when I cooperated, I got to know them good. So you went from having this very tight-knit community that you guys would kill for each other. You guys were making lots of money with each other. You were enjoying a very nice life together. What was it like to lose that sense of community? Well, losing it under that way uh, meant nothing to me. I don't know. Are you married? Mm -hmm. You got a great wife? Yes. Good. Wonderful. And you do everything for her. She does everything for you. Right. You have kids? Not yet, but we're working on it. Yeah, you're working on it. And you got a great, you got a nice smile the way you're smiling about it. Supposing tomorrow she fucking betrays you in the worst possible way. Mm. That smile will disappear in two seconds and you'll be heartbroken. You will not even believe that she was capable of not only going to bed with somebody, but betraying you in the worst possible way. So it's like a tree that's died. You just cut it and you leave it behind. It's not the same tree that gave you apples before. And that's, that makes it easy to leave in the past. Without a doubt. I guess the comparison I'm trying to draw is, uh, so I wrestled all the way through college. And when I was in college, we were, we were really good. We took you know second, third, and fourth in the nation. We were beginning of a dynasty and, and doing things really well. And then when I left and I was in the corporate world for a few years, there's a different sense of camaraderie you have with people that you're sweating and bleeding and traveling around the country and competing with to guys that are standing around the water cooler talking about the local sports team and the weather. Yeah. And so I felt a huge loss of community when I left college. And luckily, I joined a fight gym, and I built that back up. And um, I have it again, and it's, it's wonderful. But I would imagine that, I mean, not everybody betrayed you. It was, it was John Gotti. So, I mean, there's a, still, I'm imagining, a lot of people that, you had good terms with, but now that you had to leave in the past because of how your life changed. Well, when I made a deal, I made this deal. It's not on paper, but we made a deal, and it's, it, it happened. I told the government, I will never cooperate against my family. I will never co uh, cooperate against my crew. 
I ordered them to come with me on a piece of work. I could never sit on the stand against them. And there's a woman or two that I've done things with, fix a jury and stuff like that. I can't. They didn't even want to get paid. I can't. I, I, will, I will not cooperate against them. I'll tell you the story, but I won't cooperate. They agreed to that. They said, we'll never get to that. So you'll have a two-year cooperation. If we didn't indict them before that, then it's up to you. So the two years passed and I never cooperated against any of them. Mm. So there's a lot of people that I didn't betray that didn't go to jail. And they know who they are. And, and that's history now and everybody knows it. Sure. So um, if my memory serves me correct, you had to do a four-year sentence after that case, right? Was that? No, I got sentenced to five years. Five years. And you do uh, uh, 87% is good time. So a little bit less than the five years I came out, but it was a five-year sentence. Mm. And I went out, I gave them, I wasn't going to go in the program. I had money, I had things. I didn't want to be in no witness protection program. And uh, they were begging me. And then they got in touch with the prosecutor and the government, and I spoke with them. I was in Washington, I had a meeting with the witness protection people, and I didn't want to go. And they said, Sammy, give them a little something. You got five years and 19 murders, and the government treated you real good. They Give them a little something that they could pound their chest. You got you in the witness protection, and give them a little something. I felt they were right. I got a five-year sentence. I think it was great. No doubt it was great. And I joined the program with them, and I says, I'll give you one year. I'm going to give you another year. And you could do what you want with me, change my name, move me wherever you want to do for one year. And then I'm out. I quit. So you could pound your chest. I was in there with you guys. And uh, I did that. In eight months, um, uh, you're not ha supposed to have any contact with anybody or anything. I met some young woman who recognized me and left notes on my car and on my door. The marshals found out. And they were disturbed about it. Um, she knows who you are. We got to move you and start all over. I said, no, I'm in, I'm in eight months. I promise you a year. I got four more. I don't care what you're doing. You want to move me? I'll move. But I'm only giving you four more months. No, you got to start over. I said, I'm not. I don't care about her. She can know. I don't give a shit. She knows who I am. And... Uh, they say, well, well you, then you'd have to sign out. They can't force you to stay. So I signed out in eight months and went back to Arizona with my family and walked away and changed my name back from the name they gave me, which was Jimmy Moran, back to Salvatore Gravano. Now you build a new life for yourself in Arizona. Um, take us up to speed to what you've done since your mafia chapter and what's important to you now. Well, when I came back to Arizona... There, I was out of prison about four and a half years, and I got back to Arizona, and I got busted again in an ecstasy case, this is supposedly taking over Arizona and uh, the uh, ecstasy business and all this other shit. Were you a big party, or what I, got you into I, the ecstasy business? No, no, no. I just lent money mm. to them, and I got busted. I can't really get into that because I did. I'm under contract. I sure. did uh, uh, um uh, a company named Talis. It's an English company. That I'm doing a documentary strictly about what happened in Arizona with that case. But I can get to that. I got to the... So I can't discuss the facts of it, but uh, when I got sentenced on the ecstasy case, I got a 20-year sentence. Wow. And I was busted with the state, the feds, I got busted with the feds in February of 2000 uh, in the state of Arizona. Uh, in January of 2001, I got busted with the feds with a mirror case, same thing. And in 2022, I got busted in New Jersey for killing a, a, a cop, an old case, a cold case, 20 year, 21 years prior or 23 years prior. So I had three cases going. Statue of limitations didn't apply no, for that. No, not on murders, no. No. So, and uh, so anyway, I got sentenced to 20 years in uh, the federal case, 19 years with the state and running together, 
And the Iceman case, I beat the case. I didn't take a plea. I didn't do nothing. And uh, so I went to prison in uh, when I was 55 years old. And uh, what is that? Uh, I, mean, I don't remember the year right now, right the second, but I did 17 years, seven months in prison. And I got out when I was 72 years old. And I got out and I came back to Arizona. How were you treated in prison? Because I would imagine a lot of those guys looked at you like a legend and the man. Well, they, they, but they look at you in prison as a rat. Mm. When you cooperate with the government, you, you're, gonna, you're coming in there with baggage. I, I thought more than likely I would probably get killed in prison. Someone's going to order a hit and you would get shanked. Well, or... they don't have to order a hit. When you're in prison and you have that label and you're walking around the prison, there's people who want to make a name for themselves. I'm mm. the guy who killed uh, Sammy the Bull. And they put a little teardrop under their uh, face or whatever. So I'm facing that and and everything else. So How did you operate in prison to stay alive? And I'd imagine it took constant vigilance and... Awareness? How did you operate in that? I operated like I normally operate. I got all these fucking tattoos in prison. It's my chest, my back, my arms. Because I knew I was going to have a problem. So, like, I put on my gangster hat and I got my tattoos and I'm going to kill anybody who fucks with me. That was my attitude. And uh, I had a couple of beefs that were pretty strong. And uh, I didn't have any problem. I didn't walk around with an air or a thing like I'm Sammy the Bull, my shit don't stink or something like that. I never did that in prison. So I really didn't have too many problems. I got along with the Aryan brothers. The I got along with the Familia, the Mexican uh, gang. How, how does that work? Because I know I have a, a friend that's uh, went to prison in California, and even though he wasn't a Wood or a Aryan brother, you kind of have to join... Your race a little bit. I don't know if it's different politics in yeah, yeah, yeah. Arizona. You, no, it's, it, everybody you know is close with their race. I mean, but we mix, we mix and mingle all over the place. You're playing ball, or you're playing cards, so you're mixing with people. You're playing cards with black guys and Mexican guys and whatever. If there's a problem, you go back to your race where you belong. And uh, so, uh, was there anything in particular you observed about a group in prison that was either impressed you or shocked you or, you know, these guys are something that was fascinating about a particular one of those groups. The Aryan brothers, the AB guys, they, they impressed me. They were really, they're extremely dangerous. Every one of them has got hits within the prison system multiple times. Um, I don't know if these statistics are, the, the, from what I hear, they represent maybe 2% of the prison population, but almost 40 or 50% of the murders that take place in prison. Probably. So they're extremely dangerous guys. You could have, you can go into a penitentiary where there's 15, 18, 2,000 guys, and there's 15 AB guys. The whole fucking prison fears them. Wow. So if I went to prison and the Aryan Brotherhood asked me, do you roll with us or not? If I say no, I'm absolutely fucked. No, you don't have to be with them. I mean, you know, matter of fact, you shouldn't be with them because you're going to kill people in prison. If I join them. If you join them. And and if you have uh, a life sentence, I guess it doesn't really matter. Mm. That's what, that's the way that, that's why it makes them so dangerous. The, one of the guys, Paul Snyder, they called him Corn Fed. He went in, he had a 20-year sentence or something. He joined the ABs, he killed. He's got three life sentences. That means... After that pinch, he was doing time when he killed, he got a life sentence. He killed, he got a life sentence. He killed again, and he got a life sentence in prison. And then finally, he was in the ADX Supermax with me. So these guys are dangerous. They're no joke. But what, 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 they were really, really book-wise and, and really smart guys. Mm. They did things that were just, you know, smuggling shanks from one place to another in prisons that it's almost impossible to do. How they did some of these things was a uh, miracle. And they're, they're educated. They're re they educate themselves. Now, they were doing things, sending notes on the outside. They got caught doing it, so, so I'm not giving up nothing there. But they would take a little cup. They would piss in it. They get their pencil. They get their paper. And they write their note in piss. 
and it would dry up. And then they get a pencil or whatever and write their letter and send it home. When they got it at home, they got a blue light. They put the blue light on it, and the piss came out, what they said, perfectly. Mm. You could see it perfectly. Now, to design things, these things like that, they got Bibles. <coughs> and they would send a kite to somebody in another tier or another cell. Um, verse this, page this. And they have something underlined in the Bible. And they sent, they had it, they underlined certain things, and they sent it back. Now this guy is getting that Bible, and he's getting a note. Way to go. And he goes to that page, and he sees this line. Takes it out. He goes to this page, this verse. Takes this, puts it out. And puts together a fucking note right under their nose. I mean, and this was smart shit. This, this impressed me with them. They were, they were not just thugs and murderers. They were smart. They were super intelligent. So you served 17 years and some change. That's Did you 18 because it's 17, 7, so it's closer to 18. Okay, so you 18 years. Did you feel like that was a fair sentence for what you did? Did you feel like the justice system is crooked? The conditions that you lived in? What was your interpretation of that? Now, for what I did getting sentenced to the 20-year sentence was this ecstasy case. I did hardly anything. I don't think that was fair. Mm. Should I have gotten five years on 19 murders? No. That's where I should have got 20 years. It's reversed. I should have got 20 years for that and five for this. But I cooperated, and that was the deal. I wasn't going to argue with nobody getting five years. So, and, uh, but I didn't think the 20 was fair. But I got the 20 because I, they, again, remember I told you I didn't cooperate. I just a little bit, and then I never cooperated again. They asked me to cooperate against this guy. Bosco was the boss of the Westies. And I had refused. When I refused, I was dying in the feds, and I got the max. It was for refusing now. I didn't want to join. I didn't want, I didn't want to help them. I had that two-year deal. After the two years, I never testified against anybody again. And when they asked me, because I had the case with the state, and I said, no, I got indicted with the feds. So this is where the, uh, this sentence came in. Now, the, 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 uh, later on, I found out why this judge hated me. She still does, probably. But why? I took a plea so that I could get my son and my son-in-law reduced sentences. So I admitted to all this bullshit. When, I, when they were sentenced, the prosecutors went to the judge and said, Sammy got out of prison, came to Arizona, put a gun to his wife and his kids' heads and told them, go out and deal ecstasy for me. The fucking furthest thing from the truth. Mm. So now, when I look back, I know why this judge hates me. I don't, I don't even blame her. It's a woman. So when she sentenced me, she sentenced me with such venom on a case like that. 20 years, lifetime supervised release, and a hundred thousand dollar fine. And I walked away. I said, "Wow." It's because of the other case, and I got away with murder with five years. It's just, they're getting even. Then I found out later what was said. She thought you were a monster, a wife beater, a, 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 a fucking monster. So she's trying to take you out. She basically did her best to take me out. You got to remember, I wasn't a kid. I was fifty-five years old when I went in. And uh, and I'm going in with baggage. So how the fuck is this guy going to do 18 years in prisons without getting killed? Did you think you were going to die in prison? More than likely, yeah. Hmm. So Sammy, you're you're back in the free air. You're alive. You're vibrant. Um, what is keeping you passionate these days? 
Now, I'm not sure vibrant. I think I should give you $200 for that statement. <laughs> I saw your biceps creeping out of your <laughs> oh, shirt, that, man. So. <laughs> oh, is that it? Yeah. That? Okay. Guys, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. What's that question again? What's keeping you passionate these days? What do you have your eyes on and what's what occupying your now, thoughts? What I'm doing now, I'm making movies. I'm doing things in Hollywood. I'm doing social media things. You're consulting in Hollywood? I am. Yeah. I'm actually going to do a movie about one of my hits that's going to come out. I'm talking about Hollywood people right now. Nice. And uh, I got, uh, uh, like I said, on the stuff that happened in Arizona, I did a documentary. And I'm talking about a whole bunch of things. I'm dealing with good people. I put together a good team. I got this woman, Melissa, and Anna, and uh, uh, Amina. Um, people, good people around me. I'm, I'm doing an interview with you. Good guy, you seem like a real good guy, college guy. You're happily married. I, mean, I love what I'm doing. I'm not a guy who's going to go sit on. I'm 78. I'm not a guy who's going to go sit on a rocking chair. It's just not my style. I'll drop dead doing an interview somewhere. I'll be happy. I'm happy at what I'm doing now. The people I'm dealing with are good people, camera people, and people. I, I see them. I, I just it broke my heart. I just had a guy who was a camera guy black guy, this guy Gage, and uh, he just passed away from, not too long ago, from uh, fentanyl. It really fucking drives me nuts. Yeah, that's that's one of the things we were, we were talking about before is that, um, in particular, because we're, we're very close, we're about three hours from the, the Mexican border, and things are getting absolutely flooded right now with fentanyl. We were just in a homeless camp where a lady had a $20 bill, said, watch this, went around the corner, came back, just a handful of pills, some crystal meth in there, and people are dying left and right, and it's also causing us these folks to almost be like zombies, like almost a, a subhuman version of themselves. So what's your stance on that? And I guess um, if you could influence the world, what would you, what would you do? I, I hate it. Mm -hmm. I hate it. You know, there's kids that are losing their lives. I, this kid I just lost. Mm -hmm. I, I, I felt like he was his son. He's a black kid. He was a photographer. 27 years old. Mm. The kid, I mean, he could have lived, to, if he only lived to 70, 70, he got 50 years. He was robbed of 50 fucking years of life. He had no bad criminal history. He got busted twice. Both times was for drugs. Nothing serious. Great kid. I did uh, an interview with uh, Rolling Stone. He took the pictures. I called Rolling Stone up. I said, listen, give him credit for the pictures. Put his name in, in the magazine. And they did. We did a party for him. He was so fucking happy. He, Christmas, we paid him. I gave him a little cash bonus. And he says, Sammy, I appreciate you trying to help me. And I, I, I owe you the world. You, know, you don't owe me nothing. Stay straight. Do the right thing. You gotta, you, you're a creative guy. You're good at photography and editing. And you got a future. And he just died. One of, these, one of the special things I've learned doing this job is I've been able to talk to all sorts of people that I think society would write off as a bad person or um, not good. And most of these people I bump into have a story that I can see where they're coming from and I would invite over for a dinner and be very comfortable about it. Uh, where do you rank yourself on the scale of good and evil? And has there ever been a sense of, I need to atone for my past? I'm not going to atone for anything. Mm -hmm. I don't want to atone for nothing. I believe in what I was. I believe in what I did. Mm -hmm. um, as far as good and evil, I, I have to, I have a split personality. Sure. On this side, I'm a fucking out and out lion. Mm -hmm. On this side, I'm a good guy through my mother, my father, and good people around me. And these two things are in my body. And you can get me in anywhere to, uh, near those things. You know, and then I heard a story. Now, you have two wolves in you. Mm. And they're fighting. Which one wins? The one you feed. The one you feed. Yeah. So I got a lion in me, and I and I, I want him there. I don't feed him. I feed the other one. So I win most of the times. I got a temper, but uh, I don't. I sometimes the lion really wants me to bite you, mm. and I hold him back. No more. We don't do that no more. And the other guy wins, and I chase you. I don't want to be bothered with you. I don't want to do business with you. I don't want to talk to you. Stay away from me. So, Sammy, uh, where can the people find you, stay in touch with what you're doing, and, and tune in with your life? Well, I, we're going to give a link, I believe, yes. to this, and we're going to give a link 
to where to get me. I, we we just opening up in in April, a new website. We joined Wix and uh, we opened up a new website, SammyTheBull.com, and uh, we're working on a, a bunch of new projects. YouTube and uh, I'm doing uh, Q and A's, live Q and A's and stuff like that. You know, we were just talking this morning, me and Amina, is that, you know, we had 1,600, you know, people calling in. So some of them, they, they're paid, they pay a few dollars to get their question answered. And, you know, we figured we'll answer them first and then we can get to everybody else's. And then that grew. So it's hard to get to know all of them. And I'm telling the people now, it's not that I'm ignoring you. It's just so many questions. You have an avalanche. Have an avalanche of questions coming in and stuff like that. So now what I told her this morning, I said, you know, we're norm normally on for about an hour. We're, I'm going to extend it a little bit longer, but I want the people to understand. I, no matter how much I extend it, I can't get to all your questions. <laughs> There's no way possible. And uh, for you women who want to get in touch with me, Bomb chicken out now, now, right? <laughs> so, guys, I'll, I'll end it on this. Um, this has been an absolute honor and privilege to sit down with you and hear your story and hear your thoughts. And uh, it makes me feel like I have the best job in the world to be able to travel and meet people such as yourself. Uh, tune in with what this guy is doing, and we'll see you guys next week. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to say to the people, hey, Sammy? A, a great guy, and look at him. Uh, a good-looking guy. He loves his wife. He loves his job. And he's got a good future. He's a great interviewer. I'm very comfortable with him. He's, they lived up to their word. They came down. They've been very patient with the old man. So keep watching him. And to all my guys who I get, I'm going to show you this video as well. Uh, you're going to have his name and his link so that you can watch him every once in a while. And now uh, remember how the mafia works. If a lot of my people come and watch you, uh, Christmas envelopes. <laughs> Hey, bring Sammy an envelope stuffed with cash. Maybe write a couple of envelopes that say Tommy on it as well. And uh, life's a journey, folks. It's amazing and, and remarkable what your life can become with the decisions you make. So stay positive, stay happy, and we'll see you guys next week. All right, my friend. Thank you, sir.